Welcome to the History of the Early Church. Episode 49, Q and A. We finally conclude our first three century series with our questions and answers episode. First off, thank you so much to all of you who sent in questions to me. Your engagement has been highly encouraging, and I hope you judge the answers I provide here to be satisfactory. I'm going to go through all the remaining questions, which I wasn't able to cover during the previous episodes. These are in no particular order, and the topics vary quite a bit. Some of them I was able to answer fairly simply, while others had more details to unpack. With that said, let's dive in. A number of you asked about the early church and warfare and military service. Was the early church pacifist? Did Christians serve in the Roman army? For starters, we do find again and again in early Christian writers, such as Tertullian and Origen, a strong rejection to the notion of Christians participating in warfare. Christ taught his followers to love their enemies. Killing enemies in battle was still killing, on par with acts like murder, and abortion for early Christian writers. However, I think it would be inaccurate to call the early church pacifist in the modern sense of the word. Pacifism in our day is a political stance which usually involves a complete and total rejection of all forms of warfare and violence. Early Christian thinkers did often view war negatively as part of the fallen world, but they also never seriously protested the right of the Roman emperors to wage war. Their primary concern was Christians participating in these wars, as opposed to all people in general. Christian martyrs and confessors routinely declared to the persecuting magistrates that they were loyal citizens who prayed that God would keep the emperor safe and grant him victory. Origen asserted that the Christian prayers actually did more for the defense of Rome than did its legions. He even suggested that warfare would completely disappear as both the Romans and barbarians adopted Christianity. There would be no need for the emperors to fight Germans or Persians because they would all be brothers in Christ. Thus, one day, Rome would no longer need its armies. Origen did not discuss what would happen in the interim, prior to these mass conversions. In addition to the objection to killing, we must also remember that the Roman army was, like all things the Romans did, a heavily religious institution. Sacrifice to the gods and pagan ceremonies were part and parcel with military service. The Roman army was sacred, like the temples and cities it defended and the gods it fought under. Even seemingly innocuous aspects could have pagan overtones. Tertullian wrote a lengthy treatise called On the Crown, where he praises and defends a Christian soldier who refused a decorative military crown given to him and his unit as an honor, on account of the crown's connections to Greco-Roman religion. Yet, in discussing this episode, Tertullian acknowledges the fact that Christians did indeed serve in the Roman army, and that not all Christians viewed every pagan element within it as severely as he did. Christians did serve in the Roman army, as we know from both textual and archaeological evidence. You may remember the rain miracle we discussed in our coverage of the 2nd century, where Marcus Aurelius's army was almost dying of thirst in Germania before a rainstorm appeared out of nowhere. Christian apologists readily claim the miracle had occurred on account of the prayers of Christian soldiers. We also have sarcophagi of Christian soldiers dating from our period. These military sarcophagi are decorated with more subtle Christian symbols to avoid detection, but they are there nonetheless. Some Christian soldiers did, like Tertullian and others, believe military service was incompatible with their faith. We have two accounts of soldiers in Africa and Mauritania at the end of the 3rd century who refused to serve because they believed it was incompatible with the Christian religion, a decision which cost them their lives. 
However, both men were conscientious objectors, to use a modern term, and were not executed for their Christianity per se. The sources even acknowledge other Christian soldiers in the same unit who did not voice the same objections. Perhaps the best example of a Christian soldier who appears to have seen no issue at all between warfare and his faith is Julius Africanus. You'll remember Africanus from the narrative as the Christian polymath who corresponded with Origen over the authenticity of the additions to the book of Daniel found in the Septuagint. Africanus had served as a diplomat and a soldier under the Severan dynasty and composed a work called the Kestoi, which goes into great length on how best to achieve victory through even the most brutal means. This work also discusses the use of magic, so some historians have argued Africanus was not a Christian when he wrote it, but this is disputed. Some of you also asked if Christian soldiers were confined to military roles which did not involve killing, such as secretarial and administrative functionaries. It's hard to imagine they could have been able to control that. When a person joined the legions, or the auxiliaries if you were a non-citizen, they went through the same process as everyone else until they were assigned a specialty. However, this specialty was one which was ultimately determined by the officers in charge, even if the soldier himself had some input. If you want to learn more about this topic, I recommend Caesar and the Lamb, Early Christian Attitudes on War and Military Service by George Calantis, and The Early Church on Killing, a comprehensive source book on war, abortion, and capital punishment by Robert Sider. Listener Andrew M. has a fairly involved question about our earliest sources. The major events of Jesus' life took place around 30 AD. Christian documents begin turning up in the later 1st century, with specifically historical narratives like the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles appearing in the last three decades of the 1st century. Why is there such an apparent gap of silence in our documentary record? Part of what makes this question so difficult to answer are the difficulties involved with actually dating New Testament books. Our earliest sources, Paul's letters, date roughly between 50 and 62 AD. The four Gospels are most commonly dated by modern scholars in the following way, give or take a few years. Mark around 65, Matthew around 75, Luke around 85, and finally John around 95. These dates are conventional and represent the fact that most scholars place the composition of these writings in the last three decades of the first century after the destruction of Jerusalem by Titus. Few scholars would date these texts later than 100 AD, though some would propose they may have been composed earlier than the conventional dates, or at least earlier versions of the Gospels. So, for instance, scholars inclined to believe the testimony of early church fathers like Papias of Herapolis, who states the Gospel of Matthew was originally composed in a Semitic language, argue that this now lost Aramaic Gospel of Matthew existed at a much earlier point and was used as a source for the Greek Gospel of Matthew we have today. On a similar note, I'm sure many of you are aware of the synoptic problem. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke have shared material between the two of them and trying to untangle the relationship between the books has been a key concern of historians for centuries. The most common view you'll find is the two-source hypothesis. This view proposes that Matthew and Luke wrote independently of one another, but both used two of the same source documents, one of which is the Gospel of Mark, and the other is a hypothetical document referred to as Q from the word quell, a now lost collection of sayings and teachings of Jesus. Other scholars also argue for a now lost passion narrative source used by the evangelist. If any of these documents did exist, then it suggests that Christian historical writing began much earlier than we might think. However, all these documents are conjectural, and we don't possess any manuscript evidence for them. We only possess the four Gospels. 
We do, however, have fragments of older Christian texts in other New Testament writings, such as the Christological hymn in Paul's letter to the Philippians chapter 2, and an early creed in chapter 15 of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. The Acts of the Apostles even contains a letter from the Apostolic Council of Jerusalem to the Gentile Christians in Antioch and abroad. These and other small nuggets, like Paul's quotation of the words of institution, show us that the earliest Christians did have written texts in addition to oral tradition, which predate our surviving sources. To get back to Andrew's question, part of the reason for the apparent gap is because the earliest Christian writings are no longer extant. We only have the later texts they were incorporated into. However, the reason most scholars believe Christian historical writing took a number of decades to appear was because of oral tradition and living memory. The ancient world was a mostly illiterate place, with only the educated elite being able to read texts fluently. As such, oral tradition and testimony received greater and immediate importance. The 40 years between Jesus and the destruction of the temple, the earliest generation of Christians, including the apostles, were still alive and could be consulted. By the late first century, this living memory was dying off, and thus the need to record the life of Jesus became paramount. Many scholars also see an eschatological fervor in early Christianity tapering off. In this view, the earliest believers thought the Lord was returning soon, and as such, there was no need for a long-term written record at the time. A number of listeners asked about the Virgin Mary in the early church. What did Christians believe about the mother of Jesus in the first three centuries? Given the later importance of the Virgin Mary in Christian devotion, it is surprising that she is a relatively minor character in the New Testament. The infancy narrative of the Gospel of Luke stands out as the most sustained canonical text focused on Mary. However, two key related doctrines helped ensure Mary received due attention in early Christian thought, the virgin birth and the incarnation. Jesus' miraculous conception and birth served as a divine sign that the Son of God had indeed been born in human flesh. In the second century, the idea of Mary as the new or second Eve was expounded upon by the church fathers Justin Martyr and, especially, Irenaeus. By obeying God, the second Eve undid the sin of the first Eve, just as Christ, the second Adam, undid the sin of the first Adam. Justin is the first patristic author to put special focus on Mary's choice to be obedient, making Mary an active participant in salvation history. Irenaeus, building off the Pauline two Adams concept, incorporates Mary as the new Eve into his doctrine of recapitulation, where Mary's faithfulness to God plays a key and unique role in the salvation of the human race. In the late 2nd century, Mary even received an unofficial biography in a document conventionally titled the Infancy Gospel of James. Here, Mary's birth, too, is miraculous as her parents, Joachim and Anna, are unable to conceive, and so vow to God that if he grants them a child, they will dedicate their offspring to the Lord. Anna conceives, presumably through God's creative act, as it appears Joachim himself does not impregnate his wife. Mary is kept in a state of purity and holiness and is eventually raised in the Jewish temple, dedicated to God. That is, until she reaches puberty, and thus her menstruation will cause ritual impurity, per the laws in the Torah. So, Mary is entrusted to Joseph the carpenter. The story here parallels the canonical Gospels afterwards, except that Jesus is born in a cave between Bethlehem and Jerusalem. Numerous aspects of this text would eventually become the widespread beliefs about Mary's life within the early church. These include her miraculous conception, as well as the idea that Mary remained a virgin for the rest of her life, 
Jesus' brothers are presented in the text as sons of Joseph by an earlier marriage. And Mary and Joseph never have physical relations, usually referred to as Mary's perpetual virginity. In addition, Mary remains a virgin during the birth of Christ, referred to as virginity in partu, by which I mean the areas of Mary's body which would have been changed as a result of giving birth are found to be completely intact and unchanged. The text has a strange way of demonstrating this last part by having a woman named Salome express skepticism about Mary's virginity after the birth. So she attempts to inspect Mary's body by inserting her finger. Salome's hand is suddenly consumed in flames, which in turn causes her to repent, after which an angel directs her to place her hand on the Christ child so that she may be healed. The Infancy Gospel of James, along with other texts like the Syriac Odes of Solomon, attest to the growing interest in Mary in the late 2nd century. However, the major church fathers and writers of the next hundred years show comparatively little interest in the Lord's mother. Tertullian especially downplays Mary's importance. He rejects her perpetual virginity and virginity in partu. He even asserts that she was not a believer during Jesus' ministry, based on the Gospel of Mark's reference to conflict between Christ and his family. Mary received a more favorable attitude in Alexandria. Clement makes positive references to the infancy gospel of James and accepted its ideas, like Mary's virginity in part two. Origen's views on Mary are a bit harder to pin down, given the transmission history of his writings. In one homily, he appears to accept Mary's virginity in part two, and in another, reject it. He does seem, though, to have believed Mary remained a virgin for the rest of her life, beginning a tradition of consecrated virginity for women, just as Christ had done for men. Most interestingly, some scholars argue that Origen was the first church father to use the title Theotokos for Mary. Theotokos is a Greek word which is usually rendered in English as mother of God. As some of you know, Theotokos will become the source of a controversy much later in our narrative. Though it's uncertain if Origen used the word, another Christian text from the 3rd century does. This is a Greek papyri fragment from Egypt called the Sub Tuum Presidium, which contains the earliest known prayer to Mary. That is, Christians petitioning the Virgin to pray on their behalf before God. The prayer actually shows up in later Greek, Coptic, and Latin liturgical texts. The reconstructed fragment reads as follows. We take refuge beneath the protection of your compassion, Theotokos. Do not disregard our prayers in troubling times, but deliver us from danger, O only pure and blessed one. The text appears to have been used as an amulet by Egyptian Christians in the late 3rd century. Other Christian texts from around this time, specifically those of a more Gnostic bent, present Mary as a source for cosmic knowledge. Other texts regale stories of her death and miraculous entry into heaven. Though attention to Mary is relatively slim in the Church Fathers, Documents like these and the infancy gospel of James suggest that popular piety is where devotion to Mary found its first footing in the early church. If you're interested in learning more about Mary in the early church, I recommend Stephen J. Shoemaker's book, Mary and Early Christian Faith and Devotion. Listener Daisy asked about the martyrdoms of Peter and Paul. What are the facts versus the assumptions for why they were executed? Unfortunately, our knowledge of the last days of both Peter and Paul is quite sketchy. Peter disappears from the Acts of the Apostles midway through the narrative, and Luke ends his account of Paul's missionary work with his house arrest in Rome in 62 AD. Though some scholars are skeptical, most agree that the tradition that Peter went to Rome and died there is basically historical, and that his death was connected with Nero's persecution in 64 AD. 
We can therefore say that Peter was ostensibly martyred because he and the Christians were scapegoated by Nero for the great fire of Rome. Historian Timothy Barnes makes an interesting argument that Peter was burned alive using a combustible tunic as part of Nero's entertainments. The letter of Clement to the Corinthians sheds a little more light on Peter's death, describing the involvement of jealous persons. Paul is usually believed to have died during the persecution under Nero as well and been beheaded due to his Roman citizenship. However, the same passage from Clement of Rome's letter, which describes the deaths of both of the apostles, does seem to suggest that Paul was actually martyred in Spain, not Rome, confirming that the apostle to the Gentiles did in fact make his way to Roman Hispania. This is, after all, something Paul expresses his desire to do in his letter to the Romans. Beyond that, though, we really can't say much for certain about either Peter or Paul's deaths. A couple of listeners asked about the liturgical use of leavened versus unleavened bread. In our day, bread is used in the Roman Catholic Mass, and leavened bread is used in the Eastern Orthodox Divine Liturgy. Did this distinction begin back in the early church? From what I can gather, yes. The earliest Christians likely used whatever bread their local community had access to. From an early point, though, we do start to see a preference for leavened bread in the East and unleavened bread in the West. In the period of the ancient church, this doesn't appear to have caused any controversy and was simply reflective of the regional diversity of Christian worship. It would only be later in the Middle Ages that East and West would use the issue of leaven to criticize one another. On a similar note, another difference which can be seen today between East and West is the communion of children. In modern Catholic and some Protestant churches, children partake of the Eucharist for the first time once reaching a certain age, usually referred to as the age of reason, while in Orthodox churches, communion is offered regardless of age. This appears to be another one of those general differences which did not cause a stir in the early period. We even find Western references to communion being given to children, such as in Cyprian's book on the lapsed. The communion of children in the early Latin West would sometimes be limited to specific occasions, such as baptism, or when the child was near death. Listener PMJ asked about early Christian views on divorce and remarriage. In the Gospels, Jesus' own teaching on this matter appears to be quite strict. Divorce is never acceptable except for cases of sexual immorality, and marrying a divorced woman is itself considered adultery. The early church wrestled with these texts and always held up the ideal of a husband and wife united as one flesh until death. Divorce in Roman law was fairly easy by contrast, and Christian writers frequently drew distinction between the laws of this world and the laws of God. Divorce was therefore almost universally condemned by early Christian writers, and remarriage usually strongly discouraged. However, we must of course remember that the actual daily life and practice of ordinary Christians did not always align with what their leaders preached. Listener PMJ also asked what ancient sources do we possess concerning church discipline? Early Christian discipline, including topics like repentance, confession, and penance, is quite a large subject. The best place to look would be in what are referred to as church orders, collections of guides and rules for church life and practice. Among these texts are the Didache, which we discussed way back during our coverage of the Apostolic Fathers, the Apostolic Tradition, often attributed to Hippolytus of Rome, and a later compilation called the Apostolic Constitutions. We've weighed into the area of discipline and penance in the early church during our coverage of the Decian persecution, specifically the controversy over the lapsed, which Cyprian, Novatian, and Dionysius of Alexandria were part of. Penances given by the clergy varied depending on the degree of sin, such as full-blown apostasy by sacrificing to a pagan idol, 
to the less serious act of bribing an official to record a Christian as having sacrificed when they actually hadn't. You'll remember how Christians in Carthage had sought remission of their sin from the confessors, which Cyprian argued in response that only the bishops, as the successors to the apostles, along with their designated subordinates, had the authority of binding and loosing to declare sins forgiven. This was in contrast to the laxist position of Cyprian's enemies and the rigorous position of Novation, who believed the church could never declare forgiveness for apostasy. Another question from listener PMJ is about the conflict between the allegorical school of biblical interpretation, based in Alexandria, and the historical literal school, based in Antioch. One of the things I've discovered in the course of my research is that more recent scholarship is far more cautious in this area, and hesitates to speak of fixed schools of biblical exegesis. Use of both allegory and historical interpretation were not limited to Alexandria and Antioch, respectively, and writers from both regions can be found who used both. Even Origen himself, the dean of allegory, used historical literal exegesis. Both approaches believe that any interpretation of scripture had to be grounded in the text. The allegorical approach looked for signs and symbols in the text which clearly pointed to a higher spiritual meaning, while the literalist approach looked for types and symbols rooted in the salvation history revealed in the text. This conflict, if we can call it that, was often more subtle. The controversy over origin is, of course, a notable example, although that was tied into other issues which both critics and supporters of the great scholar were contesting over. The conflict between Alexandrian and Antiochian exegesis is something we will see come to the fore much later in the narrative when we discuss the early Christological controversy in the 5th century. Listener Marilyn asked about whether the Eucharistic meal was observed once a year rather than weekly. Specifically, was it restricted to a Christianized Passover meal? From what I can tell, no. The Eucharistic meal appears to have been early on a part of a regular communal feast and the breaking of bread within early Christian communities. However, the connection to Passover is certainly present in the account of the Last Supper found in the Gospels, and historians infer this also represents early Christian practice at the time the Gospels were written. Christians did indeed understand Jesus as the Passover lamb who was offered to take away the sin of the world, an idea which naturally gave the Eucharistic meal sacrificial connotations, as we discussed in our episode on life in the early church. As a side note, there is quite a bit of scholarly discussion over whether or not the Last Supper itself was a proper Passover Seder between Jesus and his disciples. Listener PMJ also asked, when did cardinals appear, the body of bishops in the Vatican, who elect the Pope of Rome? In our period, the mechanisms for episcopal elections varied enormously, even within the early Roman Church. The College of Cardinals proper is of medieval origin, when the succession of the papacy became more regulated and controlled, and so postdates the period of our podcast. Listener Peter asked about the early Ethiopian church. As some of you may know, Ethiopia was one of the first kingdoms to convert to Christianity. This occurred in the 4th century, and we will certainly be covering it in our podcast once the narrative resumes. Listener Brad asked about clerical celibacy. Was it mandatory in the early church that clergy be celibate? The answer is, of course, yes and no. Many of the apostles were married, and so were their early successors. During our discussion of Dionysius of Alexandria, there was mention of an elderly Egyptian bishop who fled into the desert with his wife, only for them both to be slain by Arab raiders. <laughs> 
Generally speaking, there did emerge a general trend to favor celibate bishops in the Greek East and celibacy for both bishops and presbyters in the Latin West. These were by no means hard and fast distinctions, though, and examples of both could be found on either side of the Mediterranean. However, these preferences would eventually become enshrined in canon law in later times. In the 4th and 5th centuries, the rise of monasticism would cause the church to increasingly draw its bishops from among the monks, and therefore episcopal celibacy became more and more the rule of the day. The one outlier here, though, is the Church of the East. You may remember from our episode on the early Church of the East how in ancient Persia, asceticism was regarded negatively because Zoroastrians believed it was a refusal to participate in the good work of Ahura Mazda. This was in contrast to the Greco-Roman world where asceticism was regarded as an impressive personal feat. As such, clergy of all ranks, even bishops, were normally married in the ancient Christian communities of Babylonia and Iran. Lastly, many of you asked me about my personal faith. Am I a Christian? And if so, what sort of Christian am I? Based on the general tone of this podcast, I think it will be of no surprise to anyone that I myself am personally a Christian. Different listeners have asked if I'm Catholic, Orthodox, or Protestant. I have received messages from listeners of various Christian backgrounds as well as from non-Christian listeners. All this tells me I've done a fair job at making the podcast accessible to everyone, regardless of religious affiliation. I'm quite happy about this, as I believe learning about the history of the early church is of value to all. It also tells me that the podcast has maintained a certain level of neutrality and hasn't veered into giving a partisan account of church history. This is something I've striven to do since the podcast began. I believe firmly that the early Christians should speak for themselves and not be forced into some predetermined agenda. Though I think it's fair to say I adopt a more traditional Christian approach to the main narrative, I've tried to make sure the show doesn't come off as catering to a specific tradition's understanding of early church history. As we move into the 4th century, this is going to be even more important for the podcast to maintain. It is because of the importance of this neutrality that I must disappoint many of you listeners and not reveal my own Christian tradition. Perhaps when the podcast is over, I'll fully disclose my own faith, but I don't want explicit knowledge of my religious identification to influence anyone's perception of the show, negatively or positively. I know that wasn't the answer most of you were hoping for, but let me divulge at least this. For those of you reading ahead, you know that we shall eventually be covering the creeds of the councils of Nicaea, Constantinople, and Chalcedon. All three statements of faith are ones I would personally confess. I know that doesn't really narrow it down, but I hope this long answer has been at least somewhat satisfactory. Next episode, we kick off our return to the narrative with a second introduction episode, where I give new listeners a brief summary of the last 270 years and lay some groundwork for where the story of the early church is now heading. As always, thank you for listening. Be sure to check out and subscribe to Troy and Joel's podcast, Revive Thoughts. It really is an excellent podcast which makes the Christian preachers of the past come to life. If you have questions or feedback about the History of the Early Church podcast, you can email me at historyoftheearlychurch at gmail.com Please don't forget to leave a review on iTunes or whatever podcast platform you use. Post a comment on the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash early church podcast. And don't forget to visit the website at historyoftheearlychurch.wordpress.com.